guys very warm welcome to everyone thank you for joining us today my name is christina symes i'm the managing director here at gideon and we have two wonderful presenters for you today um, it's kim hazel uh, she's our resident epidemiologist and our marketing manager and we also have Armano Trosic, uh, who is uh, currently in uh, sunny Croatia, and he's our global customer success manager um, here at Gideon. So, Kim, I'll allow you to say a couple of words about yourself before we begin. Yeah, absolutely. So, I have a, a real passion for education. I always have. I used to be the executive director of an education-based nonprofit, and so uh, we decided that one of the best things people can use Gideon for is education right and so we just got very excited about this prospect of making it more accessible and making education on infectious diseases more accessible and being that um i went through graduate school for public health and epidemiology i saw all the uses that gideon has and i really wanted to make it so that way other people could see it through my eyes in a way and could get the most out of it while also kind of empowering that next generation of infectious diseases professionals so thank you guys for joining us um, we are super super excited uh to get started the the format for today is kind of going to be um a little bit of back and forth between me and my wonderful counterpart Armano we're going to kind of walk you through all the different lessons that we currently are going to have available that we're going to be putting up on the site that will be live today which is super awesome um so what we're going to do is we're going to basically give you small overviews and then I'm going to walk you step by step through each of the lessons and then towards the end we're going to want to pick your guys's brains a little bit and kind of talk about how we can best best make lessons for you guys either covering the topics that you'd like to see next, the diseases you or your students are most interested in and that sort of thing. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Armano and we'll start talking about our first lesson. Amazing, thank you, Kim. And hi everyone, thanks for joining. It's really great to see you in this number. Uh, for those of uh, you who don't know me, uh, my name is Armano. I'm a global customer success manager. Uh, and just to give you a quick overview of uh, what is like the most important part of the role is to support customers on board the new ones. And for those that are yet to become our customers, introduce them to Gideon and help to connect the dots to understand if and how we can add value. And hopefully with our new lesson plan addition, uh, we are going to be showing you how we are improving our outreach and help to the universities. So planning lessons ahead of time means teachers enter the classroom every each day fully prepared to teach new concepts right and leading meaningful discussions with our new lesson plan we hope to assist shorten the preparation time and help engage classroom and one of the first things that we are going to tackle today is going to be bioterror uh, bioterror attacks in public places are a uh, public health emergency early detection rapid investigation are the key for example to contain such attacks bioterrorism and other highly uh, consequence biological events can result in mass casualties epidemic illnesses health healthcare worker illnesses right it can be uh, environmental contamination it can also be like a legal issue as well so we really think it's important to teach about that so it can be connected to principles of biology and virology and really what students will get from this lesson uh, it will be to describe different infectious diseases uh, used for bioterror and discuss the various ways that those infect infectious diseases attack the human body and impact the body's immune system uh, by saying that i'm handing over to kim that can go more in detail around the lesson Yes, yes. So again, this is set up with educators in mind. And a lot of times educators are required to have learning outcomes and goals set for their classes, their curriculum or their students. Um, if you're anything like me, that's like your least favorite part of lesson planning. So we went ahead and took the sting out of it by sort of doing it for you and preparing those outcomes and goals as well as overviews for you. You'll see them throughout all of our lessons. You'll also see that they do kind of differentiate in format. Um, sometimes they're in that paragraph format, sometimes they're in the bullet format. Um, if you're an educator, you're probably very familiar with those two different formats for students should be able to blank. Um, so you will see those in there. They're already put together so that way you don't have to worry about it. Each lesson then focuses on some type of discussion element. So we try to include an initial discussion point that you can either use to open up a lecture 
or you can use at the beginning of this lesson. Um, we understand that with the kind of innovation that's been done in education technologies that your class may or may not be in person. And if it's not in person, these are great opportunities for discussion board questions. Um, if you are in person, it's a great time to start a conversation within your classroom to facilitate learning as well as networking within the class itself. For this particular lesson, it does have a special section on the five phases of dealing with a bioterror attack, the five phases that are most commonly used. Um, this is going to be unique to this lesson, and it's going to have a nice little uh, sheet for you yourself to use as an educator or for students to make use of that we'll take a look at in a little bit. But what's most important is that we do include interactive and engaging activities for students. These activities are done in a variety of different ways, whether that is a uh, you know, paper and pencil worksheet or a chart or some type of in-person get up, move around the classroom or watch a video or take part in the certification course, things like that. So we do include a variety of different ways for you to get your class engaged and you can pick and choose and use which one works best for you. In this instance, for the bioterror agents, we do have a charting activity. So you'll see that we do include reference where applicable. This is also here because you can rip it and use it and put it in a PowerPoint if you need to. You can, again, provide this information directly to the students in any way that you see fit. But once they start this chart, what they're going to do is they're going to be given this information and they're going to be told to use Gideon in order to populate the information needed to complete the chart. In this instance, if we look at the first one, the disease cause would be anthrax. And then from there, the student is able to go through and determine the bioterror category, the reservoirs, the incubation period, and any other notes that they feel could be important. They can then use this later as reference for anything that they need to know about bioterror agents that are most common. But we don't expect them to have all the answers and we don't expect you to necessarily know how to use Gideon in the most efficient way. So each lesson is actually going to come complete with an actual Gideon walkthrough. It's gonna show you and tell you step-by-step step how to guide your students through the process of completing whatever activity requires Gideon. In this instance, we do walk through that explore module, which will be most useful for students for completing their bioterror agent chart. We include images as well as brief explainers, as well as those step-by-step -step directions. So that way you can understand and see things firsthand while you do it in Gideon side-by-side. This is a tool that you can either give directly to the students so they can work off the walkthrough, or you can use it so that way you can actually show the students firsthand as you do it yourself real time in the classroom with this guide. We go very much into detail in these where needed. Um, we talk about things like the pathogen page and when students would use that and what information they can find there, how they can navigate from that directly into the actual disease note page, and then taking it one step further where they can find that bioterror note that's going to give them all that information that they need and more about the actual bioterror agent when it's being used for bioterror specifically. But that's not all. We like to include references and reference sheets for students. And so in this instance, your students might not know the categories of bioterror and they might not know what actual diseases or pathogens or agents fit within those categories. And so we've created this handout that you can actually give to your students and you can provide them virtually in order for them to, again, have that reference. They can pull it out. They can use it when they need it. Um, and it's always there and accessible for them. Now we get into the more kind of meat and potatoes side of the lesson itself, where we start to talk about those uh, phases of addressing an actual bioterror event should one actually occur and what those phases are how they're typically done and what is most important during those phases. And then we move into another type of activity. So again, like I said, I like to get students up. I like to get them engaged and I like to get them talking. So one of the things that I like to include whenever I do lessons or whenever I create them is some type of thing that facilitates either discussion or cooperation or collaboration within a classroom. So in this instance, we have a bioterror preparedness plan activity and this activity is meant to be done in small groups in the classroom or on that online discussion board setting where students will actually work together to complete or create their own preparedness or uh, investigation checklist for the event of a bioterror attack. We also include sample lists and ideas just in case you give this task to the students and then they stare at you like deer in headlights, <laughs> as students do, and you need to kind of prompt or encourage them with some type of ideas to get that ball rolling. We do include those for you as well. And then, of course, those discussion questions. Again, discussion is a big part of our learning, kind of 
asking those open-ended questions and kind of creating a environment for students to think out loud can be very beneficial to their learning, especially when understanding kind of high level or very detailed topics. So we do include these wherever is applicable, along with supplemental activities. Like I was saying, some things are not fitting for everyone, right? It's not always great to do this get up and move around activity when you can't get up and move around because you're a virtual class. And so we do provide supplemental activities that can kind of fill the gap or can actually act as almost like a co-curricular thing for the student to do um, while they're in this class. So for this instance, we have a FEMA certification. So we encourage students to go and do the FEMA certification for the introduction to incident command system, as well as the fundamentals of emergency management. Both of these FEMA certifications actually provide students with a very good look at how a bioterror or any type of public health emergency could be responded to, as well as give them the tools needed in the event that something happens that they know what to do and how to help their communities. That being said, I do need to preface this for our residents that are outside the US or those that are joining us from places that are outside the US. The FEMA certification is free for everyone. However, as someone that is not a US resident, you may not be able to download or get the printable course materials or the actual like hard paper certification just because it is something that's presented by the US government. But students can still gain a lot of insight from this course. So I do encourage you guys to take a look at it and consider including it in your lessons going forward. Again, I like to keep students interested. And one thing that a lot of students find very fascinating is bioterror and history and when have attacks occurred or when have events occurred and where did they occur and why? And so we kind of included this bioterror timeline just to suit that purpose. So you can share this with your class. Again, you can make use of it in a PowerPoint or however fits you. And we also, again, have that supplemental activity. Again, we encourage you, get your students involved, get them doing something. And so one of the ways that you can do that is encourage your students to research or present on one of these specific events and then share it with their classmates. But that's not all. And we have a whole lot more in store for you than just this one lesson. So I'm gonna pass it back to Armano while we start to take a look at our next lesson. Amazing. Thank you very much, Kim. I thoroughly enjoyed this overview. Uh, for the next uh, lesson, we all know that infectious diseases are caused by types of bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi around us. And it's really important to understand how these diseases are transmitted. So for students to understand the transmission process, you can use this knowledge to protect yourself and help protect or prevent the spread of illnesses. And with these lessons, uh, students should be able to really identify uh, different infectious diseases, identify the different ways that diseases are, uh, can be spread, and also discuss how disease spread affects who are at risk, right? And this can be used for virology classes, epidemiology, or immunology. And now back to Kim uh, to guide us through this uh, new lesson. Yes, so taking kind of a deeper look at the disease spread and epidemics lesson that we have, you're gonna again see those learning outcomes, goals, and overview. Again, we do have an initial discussion question for you to utilize in your classes in order to get them thinking along the right mindset. We do feature another chart type activity. You'll see that a lot of our lessons feature these because it's a great way to get students feet wet when working with Gideon. And it also kind of gives them some preliminary information that they might need to complete other activities later on. And of course, my discussion questions. I love including those because again, you can really get your students engaged by making sure that they're understanding things while they can also help explain it better for the other students in the classroom. So taking a look at this chart, you'll see that it's set up in a very similar way to the bioterror agent chart, but it is actually covering different things. So this is where students are gonna have to find the agent, reservoir, vector, and vehicle of a specific disease, which is gonna tell them a lot about how that disease can be spread and who might be at risk. But then they also have a section for notes where they can include some further information that might benefit them. Once they've completed this, again, I don't expect them to do it on their own. And I don't expect you guys to know everything there is to know about Gideon. So we will include that Gideon walkthrough for you in the lesson as well. That's going to walk you through exactly where you can find the information that's needed within Gideon's Explore module. Again, you see that these are very detailed walkthroughs made for you guys. That way you can have the best understanding possible of not only the Gideon interface, but the way that you can best use it in your classroom. 
Also, I like to point out fun things like the outbreak maps and students can get a whole lot of information visually from these outbreak maps. So I do encourage making use of them whenever possible during a lesson. But charts are fun, right? But they're not everything that a student can do. And I like to get everybody up. So let's actually do an activity. So the way that this activity is going to work is it's typically best for an in-person setting. Um, I might consider maybe finding a way that I can translate this for these online courses later, but as of now, this is kind of an in-person activity that you don't actually divulge background information to the students. They're going to learn as they go, and they're going to kind of witness something that most students have an idea of how something spreads, but this will really show them how it can spread easily. So in this activity, every student in the class is going to be given a number. Incidentally, every student in the class except for one is going to be given the number one and every other student that doesn't have one that one person that starts this epidemic is going to be given a zero this person is going to have a zero and they're going to walk around the room and multiply their zero with everyone else's one and as they do that that person is going to become a zero and it's going to kind of facilitate a spread of an infectious agent so they're going to be able to see how this infective agent would actually make its way through a population within their classroom we do include specific student directions for you for these activities. So that way you can, again, take these, you can put it in your PowerPoint to include in your lesson. You can print this out and cut around the student direction section so your students have a hard copy of directions. You can include just maybe a few per class or you can give each to a student. But again, I know that not everyone can do these activities. So there is a video that you can watch instead. This video kind of shows how diseases can spread. It's done by the slow-mo guys on YouTube, if anyone has heard of them. But the idea behind it is essentially that they take ping pong balls and mouse traps in order to show you what it's like when a disease spreads. If you've never seen this video, I do encourage you to take a few minutes to watch it because it's very interesting and also very amusing to watch. We include activity leader or facilitator directions for you so that way you don't have to kind of make it up on the fly or you don't have to try to piece together what should be done and how the activity itself should run. You're going to have all that information at your fingertips. It's going to walk you through step by step how to do this actual activity. We then include follow up. So for this activity, it's kind of a second part of the activity. This is where the students are going to realize what's occurred and you're going to record how many zeros were in the class at each round and you can actually further use that to make a chart that the students can then take a look at how the epidemic curve took place in the classroom and how it mimics or does not mimic real life and that sort of thing. So we include all of that there for you in detail written out as well as the discussion questions and again we don't leave anything up to you to create on your own because the point of these is to make your life easier. So what <laughs> we did is we included this individual record sheet so that way you don't have to actually prep this for the student. You can print it out, you can hand it to the student that's supposed to have it, as well as um, the record sheet for the rest of the class. You also have your um, educator or facilitator record sheet where you would actually be able to kind of capture the number of zeros that are available at any given moment within the activity itself. This lesson is special. So it's actually kind of a two for one. Um, we do have a series of lessons that we're going to be creating that are case studies. And these case studies are going to look at specific diseases. And so within this lesson, there is an Ebola case study. The case studies are all gonna kind of follow this pattern. So whenever we create one for a new disease or a different disease in the future, you'll be able to actually kind of see that it very much models this setup. That being said, each of them is going to feature a student sheet as well as some information for educators. So the way that they're all going to start, we're going to encourage students to get to know whatever disease it is. In this case, it's Ebola. So we encourage students to go in that Gideon interface, go into the Explore module, make it to that disease note, and really read about what Ebola is and investigate it. You know, check out that worldwide note, check out that outbreak map, do those things to kind of familiarize yourself with Ebola before you get into the nitty gritty of the case. Then students are going to be pre presented, pardon me, with an actual real life example. So in this instance, we are talking about the 2013-2014 Ebola outbreak that took place in Western Africa. So students are going to get some information of what happened then, what, inv what investigators did uh, to combat this spread and how it turned into an epidemic and why. Further from that, we include our teacher sheet. Again, a supplemental activity is here. 
uh, students can actually go and watch this video. Um, that's a TED talk, a TED education TED talk specifically about pandemic spread. And then we include some further activities that you can do within the classroom, such as creating an Ebola timeline um, where students will produce kind of a timeline of those relevant outbreaks during this epidemic. And then they can kind of think about, okay, why were those significant and what was most significant about them and how did they impact the epidemic spread? We also encourage students to get to know the process of making charts or understanding and reading epidemiologic charts. So we do include a section of charts within all of these case studies where we will show some charts from Gideon. Again, these are designed this way so that way you can grab and fold these and put them into your PowerPoint or you can go straight into Gideon's module, the quantify module specifically, and you can go in and you can say, this is the chart that I wanna show my students and you can pull it up on the screen in real time. We also include these discussion questions again, um, super important for students to kind of think about things in a special way, but then also we give you kind of a prompt for an activity where students can go into Gideon in that quantify module and they can make their own charts. So they can look at country to country within Western Africa and see how Ebola was hitting different countries in different ways. This is also maybe a good time for you to explain to students the importance of comparing case rates across countries rather than just direct cases to direct cases and why that could be crucial and why that could be a mistake. That being said, don't expect everyone to know the quantify module inside and out like we do. So there is a walkthrough for that as well that again, does that very detailed breakdown of everything that you need to know in order to make these charts and to view them both in a chart or graph or table view. That being said, that's kind of the end of this disease spread lesson. So I can pass it back to Armano so he can give us kind of a little bit of a brief orientation before we move into the next lesson. Of course, thank you very much, Kim. And one of the things that I want to also point out as one of our new features is that you can download the outbreaks map as well to include it into your PowerPoint presentation uh, and bring it to the class. So in the next lesson plan, we are going to talk about medically important pathogens, right? So history, uh, throughout the history, the bacteria have been the cause of some of the most deadly diseases and widespread epidemics of human civilization. Smallpox, malaria, diseases caused by other microbes have killed more humans than bacteria diseases, but diseases such as tuberculosis or typhus, cholera, dysentery, or pneumonia have taken a large toll on humanity. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and diarrhea were the three leading causes of that. So what that means, like water purification, immunization, such as vaccination and antibiotic treatments have reduced the morbidity and the mortality of bacteria diseases in the 21st century, at least in developed world where there are acceptable cultural practices. So importance of this lesson plan is for students to be able to identify pathogens using Gideon, understanding basic tests used in the lab for specific microbe types. Um, so this would be probably best fitted for microbiology or medical microbiology. And over to you, Kim. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Armana was saying, this one's a little bit more detailed and a little bit more geared towards those students that are a little bit more scientifically or lab savvy. Um, so the way that this one works is because it is a little bit more technical, you'll see that the initial discussion section of this lesson has some more kind of technical um, questions that are meant to establish kind of a baseline of understanding within a classroom. So talking about what types of uh, agents there are or what types of different stains can be used or what part of the bacteria that they stay in, that sort of thing. And maybe um, some other further questions are included here to make students uh, kind of maybe think about the role of a microbiologist in today's society, especially when you think about like in the world post COVID and how are microbiology labs used and how are they understood now and where do they go and what do they do during an investigation and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the idea behind this discussion is to really get students thinking about the field as a whole and some very technical aspects of it. This activity is again a type of chart. However, it has a bit of a twist to it, and it's much more interesting than some of the other charts, in my opinion, because you do get to use one of Gideon's most interesting and interactive interfaces that I think exists within the entire Gideon application. So what we have is we have a chart set up where students are given the information that was found in the lab 
And with this information, they can actually go to Gideon's lab module. They can use the decision tree format and they can actually put in how these tests were done, what, what the result was, which they're given in this chart. And then they're able to find the specific bacteria, mycobacteria or yeast that came up as a result of these tests. So if they had something that was unknown and they had these tests and these are the results, what do they know about the actual um, bacteria or yeast or mycobacteria that they found? So we have charts for each of those different types of things, all kind of have a sub-module within that lab module so that way students can put in these specific um, results that they were given. And we do give that walkthrough. So those of you that are not familiar with the lab module, you can kind of get a nice little sneak peek of it here where students can go through, they can set up and select the relevant microbe group, they can select the decision tree module. Now, note there is a probability engine one, uh, that's wonderful, especially for people that are very familiar with microbiology and some of these tests and the different things that happen in the lab. Uh, but for students, I really much prefer that decision tree. It provides kind of a prettier uh, interface, but it also allows students to visually see what they're talking about. So, for example, you can see that the bacteria is up, the identify bacteria decision tree, and you have that area where you can select what shape the bacteria is. And students can actually see what shapes they might be seeing in the lab during this. So it can kind of make that visual connection to the students that benefit from that. And then as they input this information, they will actually have a list that populates for them um, and tells them kind of what bacteria or other microbe it could possibly be. We also include answer keys for you guys. We want this to be easier, not harder. So we don't have you necessarily walk through every single one of these decision tree tests. We do actually provide you answer keys so you can check your students' work or you can help them find their way to the correct answer if they didn't make it there on their own. Again, this is one of our shorter lessons, um, but you can see it's no less in detail and it does require a lot more student interaction with Gideon and also with kind of the source material that they've been learning from. So this is great for students that have some familiarity with that lab or that scientific background. That being said, um, I'm going to pass it back to Armana so he can give us a brief update for one of my favorite lessons, uh, the foodborne illnesses section. Yeah, thank you very much, Kim. Uh, so with foodborne illnesses, uh, we know that they are caused by consuming uh, food and beverages. And there are many different disease causing microbes or pathogens that can contaminate food. And these are many different types of foodborne illnesses. And most foodborne diseases are infections caused by a variety of bacteria, uh, viruses, and parasites. And we know that foodborne diseases will continue to be a matter of major concerns around the world in the foreseeable future. And this is why it is important to educate the new generations uh, in universities, right? Uh, and despite some important success at reducing the levels of certain pathogens in food that are result from better farm practices, food processing regulation, there is still work to do and in spreading that awareness. I can also give you a quick tip for following four simple steps at home to clean, separate, cook, and chill food that can protect you and your loved ones. Uh, this is my, <laughs> my understanding, but here we will dive deeper into this lesson. So I'm leaving it to Kim. Yes, so foodborne illness is something that I personally find very fascinating. Um, it was one of my favorite units that I did when I was in graduate school. So. Uh, preparing this lesson and, and making it accessible to others and also kind of putting this together was one of my personal favorites that we've created so far. So I'm very excited to show it to you guys. So again, we do cover those outcomes and goals for you. Like I said before, we do do it in a variety of different formats throughout all the lessons. This one features that bullet point method. So if that's your preference, this will be nice, quick and easy for you to pull over into your lesson. We also, of course, have an initial discussion. This one's a little bit more simple because a lot of the other information in this lesson is a little bit more technical and heavy. So everyone's favorite thing, we're gonna start with those charts. So when students start this activity, they're gonna be doing another chart. However, this one is incredibly special because they will be using it as a reference sheet for a later activity within this particular lesson. So what they're given is they're given a chart of some of the most common foodborne illnesses and what they need to do is they need to find the incubation period and the symptoms by using Gideon. 
We also already provide them with the most commonly associated foods. Um, this list is up to date and has uh, relevant information both from the CDC and the FDA. So you can rest assured that when your students get this reference material, they're able to use it later and it does have everything that they need to know about these specific uh, diseases that are foodborne. Again, we provide that walkthrough so that way students can understand how to use the Explore module, or you can show your students how to use that Explore module in order to find the relevant information. But then we get into this very in-depth um, kind of investigation activity. So the Tales from the Gala is basically designed to be a foodborne illness outbreak investigation. So what it is, is a hypothetical scenario where the student will take on the role of an epidemiologist at some local health department where some type of outbreak has occurred. Their task is to basically determine what food and pathogen could be responsible for this potential outbreak. To kind of paraphrase the scenario that they're given, essentially on Wednesday, August 10th, a local nonprofit held some type of gala to raise awareness for something. And when they did, they had an attendance of about a hundred people and they served these really great foods. But on the 11th, someone that attended woke up and they started not feeling well. They had things such as nausea, fever, chills, and stomach ache. So they scheduled a visit with their physician. By Friday of that same week, the physician had noticed that there were a variety of people with similar symptoms and that all of them had actually attended the gala. And so they consulted with their public health department in order to start an infectious disease outbreak investigation. That being said, the actual investigatory team for the foodborne illness outbreak decided that their best next steps would be to create a questionnaire that kind of gathered more information, such as who became ill when their symptoms began, what food they had eaten, and more. The team then actually gave that questionnaire to those that they could contact that attended the gala. 50 attendees received that, and out of that, only 20 had responded. What follows is actually the survey results from those 20 people. So the students are able to get hands-on kind of a look at what the actual data from one of these questionnaires might be. So they are given those 20 different responses in this worksheet format here. And then they need to use this data to find the attack rate, which food had the highest attack rate and the incubation period from the illness. So just in case the student is a little bit less familiar with terms like attack rate and stuff, we do kind of give them some little brief definitions off to the side on this worksheet. This is a guided investigation, so we don't expect them to necessarily do it all on their own, and they are kind of given step-by-step -step ways to work out which disease and pathogen could be responsible. Once they do that, then they need to find that attack rate by each food type. From there, they need to determine the incubation period, and one of the ways that a lot of people like to do this is with a graph that shows when people actually became sick. So what date it was and the number of new illnesses that occurred. From there, we can actually determine when most people became sick. We can find that mode incubation period, which can tell us what the incubation period of this specific disease is, which is super useful information for determining what pathogen it could be. Then the student is expected to use that chart they created before, their health department survey results, the attack rates that they found and their graph, in order to determine what food is most likely to have caused this outbreak. So we then prompt them with questions that they can fill out in a worksheet format, such as what pathogen they, su they suspect, as well as what actual food was contaminated. And then we also dig a little bit deeper. We ask them, you know, what about the people that ate the food but didn't get sick? Or what about the people that didn't eat the food and also got sick? And why does that happen? How do we address that as investigators? And what does that tell us? But then we do a really neat thing where we ask them to actually confirm their diagnosis with Gideon. So to kind of change the pace a little bit here, I'm actually going to have Armano show you guys what it would be like for a student to confirm the diagnosis of this particular instance or this particular patient in order to see what actual pathogen or illness could be responsible for this outbreak. So Without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Armano, who's gonna share his screen, and he's going to use that information that he was given within the scenario in order to figure out what this person might have. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and it's really important to mention that I don't have any medical background. Uh, so you can be rest assured that uh, we are able uh, to engage people who are not uh, medically savvy uh, in that regard. 
So here we have our diagnose module, which is our step-by-step -step purposely designed to engage classrooms. So we do have different options of probability engine that is used for professional clinicians. But this one is really intuitive when it's used. So I can click somewhere here in the abdominal section and I can select, for example, uh, options that I need to input. So for example, one of the options is abdominal pain. So I would click yes. Uh, if I have something, for example, I can see already on the right side of the screen that we have 10 entries that are displayed through our differential diagnosis preview. I can also use my search option here where I can say, for example, fever, right? I can select fever. Now I can say nausea. So nausea this. Now, if I have anything else, I can input here or I can go on the next part, which is additional findings. Uh, here, I can input something uh, that I need to. If I need to, I can then go into timing, right? With this lesson plan, I was given uh, the date of the exposure when it began. So it was on August of 10th and it ended on August the 10th but the disease onset was August 11th. So here we, will see, we are seeing now how things are changing on the right side of my screen. And if I can click next, I can select, for example, duration, I can select location, age, and so on. So in this particular preview, I can show the full table. We see salmonellosis on 39%. Uh, I can see rotavirus infection on 19% and so on. This will help with our lesson plan. Um, I don't know, Kim, do you want to add anything else? Uh, yes. Yeah, so one thing that could also be helpful and that you could encourage your students to do, so let's say that they get to this point, I could say, hey, you know, Armano, why don't you go back into that additional finding section? Mm -hmm. um, because we had some ideas of what the food could be based on some different things that we found within the actual study itself. So he can say, yeah, that's right. Exposure, animal food, he can tell it, ingestion. And then you can look at this and you could say, oh, well, what do I think caused it? And your student can actually select from this list what type of food they think that the person may have gotten a disease from, and then they're able to select that and see how that changes their diagnosis. In this case, we think that it could be eggs from the egg salad. Everybody loves cake, and we know that for to make a cake, you need eggs. So That's one, true too. <laughs> we can see now salmonellosis going all the way to 98%. Once you explain the, uh, explore this, you can also ask, and I need to point out this because again, it helps with question our differential diagnosis uh, system, right? You can ask why not, and you can type in the disease that you are suspicious of, and we will give you the reasons why we didn't include some of those diseases, right? So this is again, another step further that you can engage your classroom in questioning things, which is always yeah, important. And also puts it puts the education and the process of education in the students hands which can be very beneficial to empower them and empower them to make their own kind of decisions and use their own thought processes and comprehending and understanding that they've gotten from their time and their courses and it gives them that feeling of like aha i did it that epiphany moment which will stick with them a lot more than if they were just told okay go here click this click this put this here um, they're able to actually take some time and dig deeper into it. And then from there, like Mano is showing you now, they can go further, they can look in that disease note, they can learn more about that infection, and then they can say with confidence, this is for sure what it is. I know that it's this, and here is why. And they can defend that decision as well. Exactly. So there was a one interesting question that was asked in the chat, where can I find this? So I have another tab opened where we can see our website, uh, giddenonline.com. So here I can go into the resources where you can find amazing blogs as well to help foster the learning, but also here are the lesson plans right below it. With lesson plans, you will be able to select different categories. Uh, you are able to see those lessons plans here. And then if you need me to email it to you in bulk, feel free to do so. Email me at armano at gideononline.com. Uh, I would be happy to do it. Um, and so it's quite easy uh, to get those lessons plans. 
Let me know if you have any questions now. We are open. <laughs> Yes, and I can also give you guys a sneak peek because there is another type of lesson plan you may have noticed on that screen that we haven't actually covered and we're not going to be covering uh, too much in depth today, but that would be our unknown illness case studies. So we are creating a series that's going to be these unknown illnesses. And so the way that these work is uh, the beginning is an educator sheet and some directions that you should give your students and then they're actually given a specific scenario. This scenario is a real world scenario. This case actually happened and students are then able to use that and Gideon, either the diagnosis module or other relevant modules in order to figure out what illness was this? What is this unknown illness that there is? And then they're given a further case of what actually occurred, uh, specifically this event taking place in Italy where they're given a ton of information about the case as well as the results of the investigation. And then they're actually given a series of worksheets to complete that force them to kind of think about things in a different way or think about things the way that an epidemiologist would actually start to look at them. And then as always, we don't expect you to necessarily populate it all yourself. We will actually have answers um, in an answer key format for you as well. But yeah, so those are kind of a sneak peek, kind of a fun little thing that we like to throw in. Um, like Mano said, we wanna give you guys some opportunities to tell us what you'd like to see, um, what you'd like to see more of, what you'd like to see less of, and other different things that you're thinking could be beneficial to the classroom. So we'd love to open it up for some questions, comments, and all of that good stuff. So I will let uh, Christina kind of manage and facilitate that discussion for us. So yes, yeah, so we do actually have one question that was sent to me in the private chat before at the very beginning. And someone asked, well, how many lessons will we have? That is a good question. So this initial set is kind of five lessons um, and then the additional case study that's going to be coming out for this unknown illness. But we do intend to be creating new ones as we go, as well as um, kind of giving you guys different tools and different resources to use within a classroom setting in order to make the best use of Gideon that you possibly can. I can't give you a definite number. Um, Hopefully the sky is the limit with it and we will eventually have virtually an unlimited database of lessons for you. Um, it's kind of our out of sight goal, but for now we are releasing that initial five pack. And obviously we are open to your feedback and suggestions. So if you want, feel free to email us uh, as well with your suggestions on what lesson plans you would like to see. In case of an isolated another... case with little information of potential infection or timing or place, how can we apply the diagnosis tool? So the diagnosis tool, you don't necessarily have to put in that onset or that timing information, and it's still going to give you the most likely illness based on the information that's provided. Um, I like to include that information because a lot of times from an epidemiologist, like epidemiological point of view, that's going to be very important in determining things, especially when it comes to foodborne illness. Um, the onset period does sort of make a difference because a lot of GI illnesses kind of cause the same sort of symptoms. And so sometimes that could be one of the best differentiating things, but your students can actually use it in a variety of different ways. And they don't necessarily have to have that information. If they don't know it, they can just leave it blank. Gideon is not going to like force them or give them a red flag or say, oh, we can't give you uh, a, a diagnosis or an idea of a diagnosis without it. So they are able to make use of that. There is an option to skip that step if they don't have that information. So just based on clinical findings that they are inputting there in the diagnosis module, we are going to give you a probability of a certain infectious diseases uh, that correlate to that. Oh, we, we do have one last question. Um, so any information about superbugs? Generally, like a general answer here, yes. <laughs> I mean, Gideon is a huge database. It has tons of information on that. We also do have um, blogs on our website, um, which people can take a look at. And within those blogs, we do have a blog that's specifically about those um, kind of resistant uh, super bugs, if you will. But um, you can also go through and you can find all of the different uh, things within Gideon. But yes, uh, on our blog, we do have uh, an antimicrobial resistant um, blog. Cool. Amazing, everyone. It was a pleasure. Uh, and hopefully we'll chat soon. Uh, and looking forward to our next webinar where uh, hopefully you will attend as well.